It begins with a case, a written petition asking the Supreme Court to act. Petitions arrive by the thousands, year after year. In quiet chambers, nine justices consider the questions, whether from a prisoner who believes he was wrongly convicted or a president defending his power as commander in chief. In a public courtroom, the great national questions are argued in a drama both austere and intimate. It has become a model for high courts throughout the world but the Supreme Court of the United States remains the most powerful judicial body on earth. They deliberate and reach their decisions in private. We are quiet, said Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, but it is the quiet of a storm center. Their legitimacy is in the Constitution, but their power rests on public faith in their independence and impartiality. The Supreme Court interprets a 200-year-old constitution, safeguarding liberty, preserving the union, and upholding the rule of law. The court poses for a group portrait whenever a new justice arrives. Though trained in the law, they deal with human dilemmas. They are people, not disembodied spirits. In all of American history, there have been just over a hundred Supreme Court justices, serving an average of 16 years. Many remain on the bench twice that long, decades after the president who appointed them has left office. I've had the honor of nominating Justice Rehnquist to be the next Chief Justice of the United States. And Presidents have always attempted to shape the court by their nominations, with mixed results. Supreme Court justices have rarely hesitated to assert their independence. The court's membership has always reflected popular sentiment through presidential nominations and the Senate's confirmation role. Once confirmed, all of us are primarily responsible to the law, to this institution, to your own conscience, and the public no longer has a direct ability to influence the decision through the ballot box. That's why that confirmation process is a very important thing. Joining this court can be a humbling experience, or as one justice said, being appointed to the Supreme Court is akin to being struck by lightning. When I got here, some of my colleagues said to me, you've got to give it three years. And, and after three years, it, it, it will not seem so overwhelming and so strange. One of them said, uh, pay no attention to the three-year rule. It takes five. I think probably it's fair to say that you really start doing your work here properly when you forget that you're here. And that takes a few years. They come to a court which is repeatedly called upon to draw the boundaries of government power, telling the president, Congress, and the states what they may or may not do. They cannot avoid controversy. But after 200 years, Americans have accepted the court's authority. It was not always that way. When the government moved to Washington in 1801, the Supreme Court was given temporary quarters in the unfinished capital. John Marshall, a promising young lawyer from Virginia, had just been named Chief Justice. Under Marshall, the court asserted for the first time the greatest of all judicial powers, striking down an act of Congress as unconstitutional. Behind John Marshall's statue in today's court building are inscribed the words of his opinion in the case of Marbury versus Madison. In a later case, Marshall wrote, we must never forget it is a constitution we are expounding. Under his leadership, the court made the constitution an effective instrument of nation building. During the Marshall years, the new court rapidly earned public respect, 
as a co-equal branch of government. 20 years later, the court faced the most divisive issue in American history. Dred Scott, a Missouri slave, claimed his freedom under an act of Congress. Under Chief Justice Roger Brooke Tawney, the court ruled that Congress had no power to ban slavery and that blacks could never be citizens, a decision that weakened the court's authority for years. The slavery question was finally resolved by the Civil War, and the Dred Scott decision is remembered as the court's great self-inflicted wound. After the war, the Constitution was amended to abolish slavery, define citizenship, and grant voting rights. The 14th Amendment told the states they could not deny due process of law or equal protection of the law to any citizen. Many people would call the 14th Amendment the second Bill of Rights. By that, they mean that just as the Bill of Rights was put into place to protect citizens against uh, federal power, the 14th Amendment has been used pervasively in our time to protect individuals against the excesses of state power. So it takes its place in the constitutional galaxy right alongside the Bill of Rights. Today's court looks to the Constitution in the tradition established by John Marshall to resolve national problems. Justices Kennedy, Stevens, Scalia, and Ginsburg talked with law professor A. E. Dick Howard. In a way, we have an advantage that John Marshall did not. We have 200 years of history, of detachment, in which we can see the folly of some ideas, the wisdom of others. So uh, the fact that we're interpreting a document that's 200 years old is not just a disadvantage. It's in a way also an advantage. Don't sign me up for that. <laughs> okay. I don't think the Constitution has become any more clear or means anything different from what it originally meant. And uh, I guess that's uh, just a difference in uh, interpretive philosophy. But uh, We disagree, uh, as you know, on some very fundamental things from time to time. But we really all share the same basic objective, and we all respect one another's good <laughs> faith in trying to achieve right. that overall objective. There's just no basic disagreement among us on what's most fundamental in what we're trying to do. We don't have the Constitution that was written in 1787 or even 1791 when the Bill of Rights was added. We have the post-Civil War amendments. We have the 19th Amendment. Remember that we the people was composed of a very small part of the people in fact inhabiting these shores. No woman could vote. People were held in bondage. Native Americans were not treated as citizens of equal stature and dignity. So those people do count among we the people mm -hmm. our Constitution embraces today, although it didn't at the start. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court receives more than 100 new cases every week, about 7,000 a year. Most arrive as petitions for certiorari, written arguments attempting to persuade this court that a lower court ruling was incorrect. The court accepts very few of them for full consideration, about a hundred a year. Newly arrived petitions, along with written arguments in cases already accepted, are sent to the justices once a week. In their chambers, each justice is assisted by a small staff of law clerks and secretaries but each of them is individually responsible for deciding each case. As Justice Brandeis said, we do our own work. <laughs>